we wanted people to start thinking much more strategically than tactically, much more about the whole organisation, not just their little piece of it. Um, we hope to get some real excitement and buy-in um, to move the dial a little from IT just being thought of as being a necessary evil, frankly, to being something which actually could really help us do things better and differently. Um, and the Agile word had to creep in at some stage. Um, we wanted to get both a bit quicker in the way we work, but also, I think, less um, sort of linear and continually going very slowly, step by step by step, which was totally at odds with the way the organisation worked everywhere else, where it's very fluid of thought, very much responsive to um, whatever the needs are out there in the real world. Now, the fears, equally, I think, are fairly universal. Um, one was that for all the fact we just got this new business strategy, could we be detailed and specific enough that actually that was going to allow us to have enough information to properly make some choices? Because if the choices are so high level, they can become almost meaningless. Um, would we get buy-in from the organisation itself? As I said earlier, tone gap is not the first thing these guys think about. And whilst we were aware that we had issues uh, about uh, suboptimal performance in the way we organised ourselves from the systems and data point of view, it wasn't the kind of thing that got them out of bed in the morning. And it needed to be something that people could understand and get behind and think, yeah, this is actually going to make our overall purpose much easier to achieve. And last thing I think is particularly my fear, to be honest, was whatever we got could become too complicated um, and inappropriate in terms of the scale. Uh, I know I repeat myself, but you know, charities do not have large amounts of money they can, they can blow on systems. It has to be something that builds on what we'd already got. So those are the kind of hopes and fears around the, the exec table, if you like, our board as we went into this piece of work. We do, however, have uh, one great advantage. If we go to the next slide, please. Or not. Okay. Um, we do have this amazing membership, and that amazing membership includes a large number of uh, both what I call IT and systems uh, businesses, also includes many of the large consultancies in the UK. And we were able to sit down with IBM in this instance, who were happy to, to give us a grant to a pro, uh, pro bono piece of work, looking in a very structured way at where we wanted to get to. Now, none of this, all the things I'm going to tell you in the next couple of slides, in any sense, uh, a great you know, moment of, of insight to you in the sense that, well, of course, this is how it works. But actually, I think the way we brought the business along with us is quite important in this. By setting out a really simple roadmap like this, first of all, the as is all it, we genuinely did not know, we did not know all the various systems and um, the ways we use them around the organisation. It sounds ridiculous, for 250 people, how many systems and applications did you have? Well, an, an awful lot more than we thought, to be honest, that's um, So I think just pulling all that together into one place could prove to be a really useful thing for everybody in the organisation. The visioning workshops, this was taking that the ITC of 14 strategic document and actually saying, well, what do we need to do to make this actually happen? What are the capabilities that we're going to need? Um, and a phrase that I don't think most people in the organisation ever, certainly never used, but people who probably haven't really ever heard, was what is the target architecture we're going to aim for? Uh, I'm going to come back to that because, again, in this audience, you sort of think, well, this is you know, obvious. Actually, for a lot of organisations, this is not obvious. 
and it became a really important thing that we put out of this work. And I think the last thing, um, effectively a digital strategy is going to underpin our overall strategy and a roadmap of how we might get there. Not one of those things that say, just spend 10 million quid and in 12 months time you can be there, we don't have 10 million quid, but actually something that was with relevant and appropriate to us. Um, we had a team of guys from IBM on BITC, and you will obviously hear IBM's version of this tomorrow, so you know I'm, I'm kind of thinking I need to watch the, uh, the, the presentation tomorrow to make sure that, that we don't get back with too much by James. Um, but I think the, um, what was really interesting was that by getting a small group of people pretty much full time on this, um, we really started to make some headway on it. And the journey for us, how we actually got through this work, was really, really important for us. It was almost as important as the outcome. Because it was so clear that we needed to buy and understand what came out of it. And, you know, I can't emphasize that too much. If anybody had thought this was being done to us, it would not have stuck without a doubt. So next slide, please. You don't have to read others. You've all been in those workshops where there are endless pieces of flip chart paper and you start putting um, post-its up on the wall. This is just a small selection from, from one of them. But the great thing it did for us was by forcing us to go through a really structured process that actually all these different silos, in fact, had effectively four common issues. Um, we'd never identified them as four common issues, but in fact we did have four. Um, kind of channels to market, that's a very un-charity sort of way of describing it, but how do we contact people and why, and what are those audiences? Really, really important to kind of get our minds around that. Um, data and knowledge management, we're an organisation that has huge amounts of data and insight, um, but actually struggled a bit to bring it to the fore because it was so diverse, a lot of it was actually in its head, and we needed to make it really, really available for people essentially. Um, connected to that was how do we make much more analytics driven decision making. Uh, so allowing us to pull that data but also to interrogate it and to use it to sort of sell what we're trying to do to not just our members but actually to the broader government community as well. And lastly and my, my favourite really was consistent use of CRM tools. We we have Salesforce as a uh, a main CRM tool. But I, I don't actually think that people in the organisation fully understood what CRM actually stood for. And we sort of, um, we nearly broke up Salesforce um, and, and used it for so many things that it was not really intended for, which is what small organisations tend to do. You kind of look at stuff and you think, what is it that we can make this thing do, even if it was never built for it, and even if it's not really the best way of using it? Um, I think above all, sort of sitting on top of this, it really allows us to understand that actually um, many, I'd almost go to say most, of what were thought to be IT issues were in fact business issues. <coughs> and again, I know that would be, you know, a blinding insight to some of you around, around this room. Um, but I think for us to be able to say, well actually, the big issue, the big issue here is we don't actually know what it is we want do. Would you mind to define it before you tell us that you like one of those with the shiny red line? Um, and in fact, much of our core infrastructure was not only fit for, for purpose, it was actually pretty good. Uh, the way we used it, however, needed a bit of playing around with. So, next slide, please. There you are, that's the money shot, isn't it? Uh, a target architecture. Um, it doesn't particularly matter exactly what's on there in a sense. But what this allowed us to do is for the first time to start to look at our systems in a whole, in a holistic sort of way. Uh, it also forced us to make those decisions internally. We got pushed in a good way 
to um, kind of stop making everything grey and it's sort of this, this sort of thing. Um, and it helped us understand what it was that we really needed digital to do for us. Um, and again, I think that's true of quite a few organisations, so much bigger than us, that it's easy to try and keep your options open and you can be everything to everybody. And that's just not a realistic place to be for most companies. It certainly isn't a realistic thing for a charity to pass on. Um, it also gave us a common language. Um, because we have this sort of siloed environment, it's taken us a long time to have a common way of describing things that everybody's doing. And this, again, really helped us start to get that common language together. So, next slide, please. And I think the other big thing that, that came out of it was we needed effectively to look at the profile of what had hitherto been this IT team hidden behind me in the cupboards in the darkest corner of the office. Um, that actually digital was essential to delivering what we wanted to deliver. Um, it didn't have enough profile, it seemed to be um, a good bunch of people, but they were sort of all the tables. They, they did whatever was asked of them and weren't really involved early enough on in some of the, the decisions that were being made. Um, so we are now moving towards a proper digital centre with a much more high profile um, lead in the, in the team and a very much more integrated approach to all the campaigning that we do. So these guys are in the beginning of things and not at the end. Um, and the other point was digital governance. Um, the word discipline is, is, is one that I love to throw into conversations with the ITC because it unsettles everybody. Um, we should have a single way of doing all of things, not in order to straight jacket people, but in time in reverse, to make things actually easier to achieve. And I think one of the big things that's come out of this piece of work for us is understanding that in fact, uh, working in a common fashion, having certain standards, having a single language, is actually a huge way to improve both the ease of working, but also just how productive we can be. So next slide, please. And all that led to digital authority. And as you can see from this front sheet, um, I think one of the things that, that's worked very well for us is although below this there is a huge amount of very, very detailed work, um, it's presented in quite an engaging way for an audience who's not fundamentally um, that excited about systems architecture. Um, and we took this round, all of our various stakeholders internally, we took it to our own exec, and Actually, the story was so compelling and so clearly set up some of the issues that everybody could see but had never quite been able to crystallise that actually it was a sort of no brainer to be truthful. So, on the next slide, a quick so, how's it now working? We went to see our board, and the board of the in the community is quite an interesting group because it's made up of about 25 people, so it's quite large. Um, most of whom, in their spare time, are not working with us, are running some of the largest businesses in the UK. So you've got a huge amount of expertise and knowledge sitting around that table. And um, again, it just breathes through as being self-evidently that this is the right thing to do, that it's the right way forward. Um, we've now recruited a chief digital officer, um, very kindly Sky. Uh, seconded somebody to us, um, and again, six, seven weeks in, the difference that having somebody, um, and this may sound very significant just with that title, but a remit that is very clear, um, and the underpinning of the work that's going to be done has been a huge benefit to us. Um, and we were able to share the, those core messages, particularly around governance, across the organisation. And for the first time, I would say that digital as an integral part of what we do is now 
an organisational issue, an organisational construct. It's not just those guys that call me out of the wooden cabinets and dark corner of the office. Um, we've embedded this now in our external uh, communication. So we do raise money not just from our members but also from foundations for a particular pieces of work. And actually being able to show that we have a coherent way forward, not just as a, an overall strategy, but as an IT and digital strategy, um, is really useful. We've had a number of people already say to us how unusual it is for a charity of our size to have something like this as a, as a piece of infrastructure, if you like. And we're now in our annual planning cycle, probably quite a few of you are as well. Um, and that's a three-year rolling planning cycle. And this document and the underpinning from it is very much at the core of what we need to do. So for the first time, certainly for a very long time, we have a properly integrated approach to planning, which includes digital IT, not as an add-on, but actually as an integral part of what we do. And we're beginning to get to that place in a very consistent core language that everybody understands. And I believe that actually if you do things properly once, it's far better than doing lots of innovative things seven or eight times, half of which don't work. Um, we have a long way to go, um, but it's been a really, really useful thing for a small organisation like us. So if you haven't been listening, thank you very much indeed. So a reminder, any last, uh, last chance for questions for Oliver from uh, slido.com. Um, in the meantime, um, don't make a cry. <laughs> I, don't <laughs> know, I don't know anything really difficult. <laughs> of course not, at least this won't be difficult. Um, in, your, in your bio, um, you worked in, uh, in the commercial field. And, um, what would you say is the single biggest difference between the the uh, charity environment for doing a project like this and, and the commercial world. You mentioned money a, a few times. Is there, yeah. That's probably the biggest single one, but is there anything other than that? Yeah, I think, um, so yes, money, put that to one side, right. vital though it clearly is. Um, I actually think, to be truthful, even bigger than money, genuinely, is um, most of you will work in corporates where you have an infrastructure with people who do many roles that you would expect them to have almost without thinking. You will have people who are architects, you will have people who are system specialists, you will have people, etc, etc, etc. Very few, except the very largest charities, have that kind of uh, infrastructure just in place. So um, when, when I arrived, uh, we didn't have any project managers, we didn't have any um, we, we had very much business as usual uh, IT team. So you are starting from scratch and you do need to sort of help people through that. So I think it's the, um, the, the assumption that you will have people who know how to do things um, is not always true. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's see, next question. What are the global or UK events and drivers that define your strategy? Well, well, I mentioned in the beginning that, that we were founded in the aftermath of Tops at Brixton. And um, I have to say that, you know, if you look at, so this is not a political statement as such, but if you look at the aftermath of Brexit, um, the UK is an enormously divided society. And that's the key thing that drives us, is where you're seeing the level of inequality where you can see that it's particularly related to the lack of large corporate investment in particular places. It's driven by lack of education uh, opportunities. I think there are a lot of places in the UK where you can, you can see a number of factors which um, we and other NGOs look at. So those are um, things that society as a whole needs to deal with. Um, governments can do a lot, but actually governments are constrained. So um, we're very much driven by, by purpose. Um, there will be specific events that then trigger 
um, a particular outcome or a particular need, but it's that underlying sort of inequality of the size of Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you how do you uh, keep or get millennials, digital thinkers, onto your board? And how how do you? That's uh, a great question. How do you get old thinkers out? <laughs> As an old thinker, I I'll take I'll take that so slightly. Literally, uh, as, as we, we, are, we are looking at the new strategy and so forth, one of the things we are looking at is how do we, um, what's the right word, re-energize and redefine our, our board, but how do we bring in people who are much more, you know, digital natives or whatever the phrase might be. I, I think um, we have some great relationships with, with uh, a number of small startups in East London, which is where we're based. And their attitude of mind is so different than um, large corporates, which I'm familiar with. Um, and we are very conscious of wanting to move more in that direction, ultimately, because we need to be able to move faster. And we don't want to be seen as just um, an organisation for very large corporates, so we are looking to expand down into a much more medium and small business arena. Okay, um, a bit of a technical question. How are you approaching the data integration issue? <laughs> well, um, I'm not necessarily the right person to, to answer this in detail, but I, by, um, by chance, I suppose, the, um, this work is obviously coinciding with GDPR which has concentrated our minds now in. Um, so actually one of the things that the, the two come together as they just do is look at, firstly, just what dates do we hold and should we be holding it, um, certainly going forward. Um, and that, that's been a revelation to us. You know, we have a lot of data that, frankly, nobody uses and we don't need. So I think there's been an opportunity to do quite a serious cut. Uh, of, of data. Um, but what the target architecture has helped us do is understand the where do we keep data and why. And just going through that question is starting to get it to give us a much more logical construction approach. Do I think we, we've cracked it yet? Well, self evidently not, but I, I think we're in pretty good order compared to you know, even some large corporates on GDPR. I bet that's the case. Um, this is a question about your IT organisation. Uh, how large is your IT organisation and how disruptive in terms of the time and resources was the strategising effort for the entire staff? Um, so, don't matter. We have, we have <coughs> five people who are full time in our IT team, which is why they were very good at doing, keeping the lights on and making everything work, but really didn't have the, the, the bandwidth to do a lot more. So it was essential that we got, um, you know, Mrs. and IBM to come in and help us. Um, but actually, effectively, uh, one and a half of those five people were pretty much full time on this. We said, this is so important, we've got to get it right. And importantly, we wanted them to feel like they own the outcomes because I could not all, all light, but I'm not an IT specialist. It was important that I guys did. Um, and now we're getting in a, a chief digital officer, that's given them much more sort of power and energy, if you like, to take it forward. Right. And the, the second part was about the, the, um, the, the time and resources, strategizing, strategizing effort on the whole, on the whole staff. Uh, was it something that involved the whole staff, or was it just the management, the, the management and the IT folks? So. Um, we, we had sort of like a, a multi-staged approach that, that's a very grand way of saying we sort of, you know, did what we could. Um, so within teams, we had uh, different areas um, putting together some of their input, but then getting uh, effectively delegates from each one of our core campaigns, our uh, core business areas, together for a couple of workshops with um, one to ones outside of that. It was quite, for us, it was quite intensive because we don't have a lot of, of um, uh, 
sort of family system. Um, but again, it felt so important that it had to be the business side had to buy into this as well. Um, and I think that's that's broadly where we've got to now. Right. Okay. Um, given the lack of monetary incentive, how do you measure the effectiveness of your plan intervention? Um, well, the way we're kind of trying to sell it, I suppose, internally is by doing this and by moving forward in a much more integrated way. Um, first thing, save everybody time. So, if you say, well, if we actually were much more organised from a digital perspective, you'd get three hours a week back to do the things you really care about, which is, you know, count off. That is a hugely motivational way of selling it to people. Now, have we done that yet? No. But are we on a route that we can see that is a real possibility? Then yes. So, that's that's one of the ways we incentivize, if you like, people to buy into it, that they're going to be able to spend more time on things that really matter to them. Okay, how quickly are the team members able to learn enough about Togo and the approach to be productive? Um, I think I might ask Jane, James to answer that tomorrow. But, uh, um, I, I think materially, in terms of things like understanding the importance of a target architecture, understanding the key things that we needed to get our heads around. Um, actually, I think you know, the logic of it works really well. Clearly, we've not got, we might have one person, I think now, who would, would claim to be reasonably expert. But I, I honestly don't think that's important. I think it's the, the next level up of how can you sell the benefits of this to a largely more IT audience. And I think that has been brought into it. And that's, yeah, it's important, the business benefits of it. Um, uh, we need to move on, so there are a few questions coming in now, but um, I'll just pick one more. Um, let's see, are the old heads <laughs> buying into data-driven architecture and objective measures in a charity? I'm taking this very personally. <laughs> um, yes, I think they are, because because people can see that this could be so much better way of doing things. So, I actually, um, slight tangent, but I don't think age has got anything to do with how resistant people are to, to change, personally. I think it's more that you need, to, you need to show people the benefits more than just his shiny new thing. That's, would stereotypically be my view of the, the, the big difference. All the folk have been persuading that it's actually going to be better. Would be, uh, would be my view, whereas some of my younger guys, it's just like, it's new, it's shiny, let's, let's give it a go. And I, and I think both are, both are actually really valid, but forcing you to be persuasive about the benefits and embracing the new, that, that's a great combination. Yeah, anyone who sees the value will embrace it. Yeah. Oliver, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time and, uh, and insight. No, thank you very much.